This is the last sermon of our September series called All Together Christian. We've looked at how we ourselves become thoroughly Christian as individuals and how we become a Christian community altogether. And our question uh, these past few weeks has been what makes us all together Christian, thoroughly Christian and Christian as a community. And these past few weeks, we've been looking to John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, because he wrote about three simple rules. And we've been looking at these three simple rules to guide us as we seek to become altogether Christian in both senses. These three simple rules of living are a kind of blueprint, um, and they show us uh, a way to follow Jesus. In addition to Wesley's three simple rules, we've also had some key passages from this letter to the Romans, and these passages of Scripture have served as a touchstone for us as well. Now, last Sunday, David condensed two sermons into one, combining rule number one and rule number two. On our journey toward becoming altogether Christian, we, number one, do no harm. And number two, we do good. Now, doing no harm and doing good are both, indeed, simple rules to guide our faithful living. But last week we also recognized that simple they may be, they're not easy to actually practice day in and day out. And the same is true for rule number three. Rule number three expressed in a modern way is stay in love with God. Stay in love with God. John Wesley, um, in his 18th century way of speaking, called it this. He said, attend upon the ordinances of God. Well, the late Reuben uh, Job, one of our late bishops, he rightly comments that the word ordinance just sounds strange to us. We don't really use that word anymore. But to John Wesley in his day, the word ordinance was a word that described the spiritual practices that kept the relationship between God and human beings vital and alive and growing. So the third rule that helps us become altogether Christian is about spiritual practices that nurture a loving relationship with God. Wesley named six specific spiritual practices that help us stay in love with God. He named the public worship of God, the Lord's Supper, private and family prayer, searching the scriptures, Bible study, and my least favorite, fasting. Now, these spiritual practices to John Wesley and the early Methodists, they felt that these practices kept followers of Jesus in God's presence and in God's power. Through these particular spiritual practices, we find our moral direction. We find our courage, and we find our strength to live as disciples of Jesus Christ. He saw these spiritual practices as forming us and transforming us more and more each day into the image of Jesus. Spiritual practices make real our belonging to God. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans, as we heard, we don't live for ourselves and we don't die for ourselves. If we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live 
or whether we die, we belong to God. And spiritual practices, when they are faithfully offered, empower us to do just that, to live and die as God's own, God's own people. Simply put, it's through our regular spiritual practices that we answer a question that Jesus asked his disciple Peter after the resurrection. Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? And Jesus asks us that same question. Jesus asks us that same question every single day of our lives. Do you love me? And the amazing thing about spiritual practices is that it's our way of giving a resounding yes to God. Yes, I love you, Jesus. Yes, I love you, God, because I am offering these spiritual practices and I am growing in love. I am staying in love with you. Spiritual practices, they are our yes to God. Now, today we might name our spiritual practices differently and we might add to the list that John Wesley made. Each of us, because we are unique, we can discover ways of grace to nurture our relationship with God. Each of us can look at the spiritual practices available to us and bundle together several of them that help us stay in love with God. Now that said, there are some core practices that are common to us all, that we need to incorporate into our lives in some way, shape, or form. They, they are core to us because they are scriptural, because they have been handed down by church tradition and discernment. Some practices have stood the test of time, of experience, and they have proven effective by wise and discerning minds. So in order to stay in love with God, there are some key things that we need to do. We do need to devote ourselves to a daily time of prayer. A daily time of prayer. We do need to reflect upon and study Holy Scripture. We do need to participate regularly in the life of a Christian community, including um, in coming to weekly worship and receiving Holy Communion. We need to do acts of goodness and mercy. And we need to share and learn from others who are also on this journey of following Jesus. But from there, and, and, and even within these core practices, we do have so many different possibilities of form and expression. Take daily prayer, for example. There isn't just one way to pray. Now, we might have been taught that, or we might have thought that there was a right way to pray, and we might have felt badly at various points in our lives when we couldn't pray that way and didn't feel that um, we were successful in prayer, that somehow we were failures in prayer. But the truth is, there are many different ways to pray. The Reverend Patricia D. Brown, she's an elder in the United Methodist Church, and she wrote a marvelous book entitled Paths to Prayer, Finding Your Own Way to Pray the Presence of God. Paths to Prayer, and I actually got the subtitle wrong. Finding Your Own Way to the Presence of God. Now in the book, she shows you how to discover something about your prayer type. Now, she's not trying to put you in a box, but what she is saying is that there are ways natural to you 
that make you actually want to pray. That prayer flows out of you rather than feeling like a duty or something that you have to do. That if you can discover what comes naturally to do, for you to do, then prayer becomes um, just living water springing out of your heart. And then she does a marvelous thing that she presents 40 different ways, 40 different ways of praying based on the 2,000 plus years of Christian tradition. And she's grouped these according to these different prayer types. Now in my work as a pastor, I've seen people's lives changed by this book. People who have struggled with prayer or who have not prayed at all suddenly find themselves praying in ways that are better suited for their personality or their nature. Other people realize that what they've discounted um, as prayer in their lives actually is prayer. And the most amazing thing to witness as a pastor is seeing people's prayer lives, their prayer practice coming alive and vibrant, and seeing that their relationship with God blossoms. Likewise, there are many different ways to study and reflect on Scripture. There are many different ways to worship together. There are many different ways to serve. And there are many different ways to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Beyond these core practices that we all incorporate in some way or another, there are also others that help us to stay in love with God. Some people journal. Some go on pilgrimage. Some find cooking or gardening as a way to nurture their love of God. Others find God in creation. Still others learn to love God through forms of art. And some nurture their relationship with God through practices adapted from other religious traditions like meditation, yoga, or lighting Sabbath candles with Jewish prayers. What richness God gives us as means of grace. What bounty of spiritual practices there are for us to stay in love with God. We could be as poetic as Elizabeth Barrett Browning, who wrote in her sonnet, How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. And then we could name practices one by one with joy and with gratitude that God has given us to stay in love with him. Indeed, when you think about it, we have an embarrassment of riches. Yet so often this blessed diversity is a source of our division in the church. Christians have a long history of disagreeing among ourselves about which practices are the right ones for staying in love with God. Our passage from Romans, in that passage, Paul acknowledges that there are differences in practice, particularly between Jewish believers and the Gentile or non-Jewish believers. There's conflict among these various believers and in the house churches because each group divided into factions based on spiritual practices are highly critical of the other. Each faction who has found their way of staying in love with God harshly judges the other because they don't do it the same way. And we're not comfortably removed from this dynamic. While our differences are no longer Jew or Gentile, we have plenty of disagreements about other practices and we are as capable of judging severely. We've known division to erupt from the so-called worship wars, contemporary worship versus traditional styles of worship. 
We've taken issue with what translation of the Bible other people are using, thinking that there is one best, one right translation. We've disputed methods of receiving Holy Communion other than the one that we prefer. We might feel strongly about whether people should be in Sunday school or whether our Bible study takes on the form of more informal meet-at-homes, small groups. We may discount other people's way of praying. Some of us might like set prayers, while others really feel that the most authentic prayer is spontaneous. Some of us want emotional, deeply felt prayer, while others want prayer to be dignified and solemn. We have arguments over what people and what causes we want to serve, and we also argue about how to do it. But Paul interrupts our very contemporary disagreements and divisions, saying this, Why do you judge your brother or sister? Why do you look down on your brother or sister? Why do you judge the servant of another, Paul says? God has accepted them. Indeed, that gives us pause when we think about staying in love with God, when we think about all the ways that God has created us to to help us stay in love with God. Who are we? Who are we to judge what brings someone else closer to God and Jesus Christ? when the practice itself has integrity and it's not contrary to the gospel or to loving God with our whole being and our neighbor as ourselves. The 16th century saint, John of the Cross, wrote this. He said, at the evening of life, we shall be judged on our love. At the end of the day, What matters is that our spiritual practices nurture our love of God in Jesus Christ and that this love of God flows to our neighbor. May we be altogether Christian when Jesus asks us, Do you love me? Let us have the courage to offer our own yes to this question in the form of an intentional spiritual life. And let us support each other, each one of us supporting each other as we ourselves in our own way is made into a total yes for God. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen.